Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to week three here in criminal investigations. We're past the halfway point at this time, uh, or, or we're in the halfway point week. Um, real quick, before we move on, um, for those of you who um, had to create your own crime scene, make sure you get that done. Your your crime scene report will be due next, I believe, next week. Um, or it might be the end of this week. I mean, let me, you know, it is this week. So make sure you get that done and get it, get your report, video, I mean, your report, your photos, and your uh, crime scene sketch submitted. They'll be se submitted separately, um, you know, with as three different items. Um, and, and I did have one person ask about the, the diagram. Look at the, the, I think it was like the 20 minute mark in the, then video number two or chapter two video on documentation if you want to look at uh, you know some hints on how to, to make your your crime scene sketch it should be a very simple sketch you've only got one item of evidence uh, to, to mark the location and you've got the di you know the measurements of the uh, the, the, the um, scene itself you know the porch or whatever you have uh, your your piece of evidence at so it should be a very simple diagram that's complete make sure you have a key and give all the measurements and uh, that type of thing. Um, again, watch that video, 21-minute uh, mark, somewhere right in that area, and you'll, you'll, you'll kind of look through that. Um, so let me get out of the way, and we'll talk about what we've got going on this week besides submitting your crime scene reports and photos, etc. Uh, this week, you need to complete your follow-up post to Discussion 1 if you haven't already. Again, it's something you really want to do before the exam. So keep that in mind with discussion number two. Uh, you'll also be looking at chapter 21 on preparing for and presenting cases in court. Um, work on that discussion as you're reading the chapter and as you're watching the video. Make sure you take the quiz. You'll need to make 70 to move on to exam number two. Exam number two is going to be like the first one, and everybody that took the exam in this class passed it. That's great. Looks like we had two A's, two B's, and two C's and two people didn't take it. Now, the two people that didn't take it, you're way behind. you got to catch up. You, know, you, you, you can't let that happen in a course that's, a, that's um, you know, so short. So please catch up um, and get the week three material done on time, or you'll, uh, you'll definitely uh, find yourself losing letter grades. After you've taken the exam, then chapter eight and nine will be the next two chapters you'll look at. Chapter 8 is on death investigations, and Chapter 9 is on assaults, domestic violence, stalking, and elder abuse. Um, they'll be part of the discussion number 3, so go ahead and download that and be working on that as you move forward. Uh, so that, that's kind of pretty simple. I did have one question that a student emailed me about, um, and let me kind of pull up what my response to them was. Uh, Got to get over to the right screen. Hang on. Whoops, that wasn't what I was trying to pull up. Okay, here it is. They were asking about the difference between competent uh, evidence versus material evidence. And in order for evidence to be admissible in court, it's got to be both competent and material. Now, competent is that it complies with the traditional notions of reliability, that it's considered trustworthy. An example of evidence that is considered competent would be fingerprint identification, because over the years they've been found to be reliable, and the courts have admitted them. I've testified many times in courts on fingerprints. On the other hand, a technology or a forensic um, investigative tool that we used for a short time in the early 2000s, a uh, dog scent uh, identification lines up has been found that it's not reliable, and it, it is not considered competent now though it was for a short period of time, and it's not admissible. And, you know, dog scent, it's, it's where you, you would collect a scent at the crime scene. You know, if you had a person that handled something, you'd take a swab, you'd put on the swab. So in, in theory, that would raise the scent of the person that handled it. You then sealed it, you, you uh, put it in evidence and stored it in a freezer until the, you developed a suspect. Then when you developed a suspect, you took swabs and you, you would swab five different people, including the suspect, you'd put them in a can, then you would have the, the scent dog sniff the, uh, the sample that was collected at the crime scene, and then they would go around to the five cans, 
and in theory they alerted on the can that had the scent of the individual that was left at the crime scene. Uh, and it worked. Maybe not all the time, but it worked. It, but it wasn't considered reliable. So it is not admissible into evidence because it's not reliable. Now, on the other hand, the, um, uh, the other type of evidence that we have is going to be material evidence. Um, material evidence is evidence that has a tendency to prove the facts in dispute in the case. It, they go to show that a person either committed the crime or the contrary. It could be exculpatory evidence, and it shows that they didn't commit the crime. But it's got to be to the point. I mean, it's got to be maybe the motive of the case. Maybe it's an eyewitness that saw the shooting, or maybe it, it's, uh, you know, the fingerprints of the suspect at the crime scene. So that's the material part. Now, in the you know, as an example, um, if you had a crime scene where someone was stabbed, and at that crime scene, the crime scene investigators took a, a scent swab from you know the the knife that was used. So it's got the scent of the person that committed the crime, and we store that in evidence. And then we develop a suspect and we get a search warrant and we search the, the suspect's house. And in the suspect's house, uh, the fingerprint officer fingerprints the medicine cabinet. Doesn't find anything in the medicine cabinet, but he fingerprints it. And he is able to identify the suspect's fingerprints on the medicine cabinet at the suspect's house. Now, they also do a dog scent lineup and the dog alerts on the can that has the scent a known example scent swab of the suspect. Well, that scent would be considered material because if it sh if if the dog actually alerted because the scent was present at the crime scene, that's very material. That puts the suspect at the crime scene. But that evidence wouldn't be admissible because it's not competent. It's it it doesn't uh, fit the criteria of being reliable. On the other hand, fingerprints are reliable. They are good. So that print, we can say that when the fingerprint examiner says that print belongs to the suspect, that is competent evidence. But is it material? I mean, does the fingerprints of the suspect being on the uh, medicine cabinet at the house that he lives in, is that material to a crime that occurred somewhere else? No. It's not material, so that evidence wouldn't be admissible. So that's kind of the, you know, the difference between the two. Uh, if you ever have questions about things and don't know, please you know, send me an email and I'll, I'll answer them to the best of my ability. Well, that's all I've got for you today. Uh, good luck on exam two, and uh, make sure you get those crime scene reports and get all that material submitted uh, on time. And uh, if you are behind, please catch up. I want everybody to complete the course. I'll talk to you again next week.